Welcome everybody to this podcast, part of the Institute for Social Responsibility at Edge Hill University's International Women's Day events 2022. Our theme is to look at women who have had greatness thrust upon them, accidental campaigners, trailblazers, advocates, and in the case of today's interviewee, politicians. Before I introduce Jane Brophy, former MEP for the Northwest Region, I will give you a little bit of background. When the UK voted to leave the European Union in 2016, is it was expected that by 2019 we would have left, and thus we would not be participating in the Euro elections that year. As it was, various issues, including the backstop, meant that we were still in the European Union in 2019, and so were able to participate in those elections. Jane Brophy had been a campaigner, councillor, a mayoral candidate, and a parliamentary candidate in the Northwest region many times. She was on the list of Liberal Democrat candidates at number two. The Liberal Democrats had not won two seats in the Euro election since 2004. In fact, they went into the 2019 Euro elections with no seats. So it was a great surprise when Jane was elected eighth out of eight candidates for the Northwest and the second Liberal Democrat MP after Chris Davis. In so doing, she became the accidental MEP. So today we discuss with Jane how this impacted her life and what she is and what she achieved during her short term in the European Parliament. So welcome, Jane. Hello, Joe. It's good to be here. Hi. So let's go straight into it. Jane, I wondered if you could take us back to that night when you discovered you'd been elected. It was very unexpected and I guess had an immediate impact on your life. Can you tell us what you were feeling when you got that news? It was incredible. Um, completely unexpected and not where my life was at the time. It was a series of lucky events, really. The first lucky event was the fact that the European election was taking place at all. Um, the second lucky event was the fact I was number two on the list, which given that I'd been number four or five last time, wasn't expected because um, the number two was particularly um, well known. And so being number two was just an interesting place, but not nobody expected that the second MEP for the Northwest would be a Liberal Democrat. Nobody expected us to even have one Liberal Democrat, never mind about two. So on the election night, I kept very calm um, got myself immersed in the facts of the election and sat next to somebody I know Joe knows very well called Richard Marbrow, who's a bit of a, um, a data, um, he understands the data. So I sat staring at the screen with him all evening, looking at the numbers going up and down while everybody around us was getting twitchy and excited. I was more interested in the probability in the data. So I focused at this computer screen for probably the best part of about three hours at the count, looking at the vote going up and down. And I could see it was very close. Um, and then eventually it looked likely as um, particular regions in the Northwest came in, like Stockport and areas where we usually do well and, and Westmoreland and Longsdale, the Cumbria area. And it was starting to look possible. Um, but by the time the it was possible. It was probably, you know, very, very late in the evening. Everybody was exhausted. So it was um, that combination of exhaustion and euphoria, which I think often people do experience on election nights anyway, and an absolute complete surprise. So much so that my family had gathered what was going on and were trying to get in through the doors of Manchester Town Hall and they couldn't get in. My son and my husband couldn't get through the doors because um, they didn't have the security clearance. Um, I wasn't even planned that I would even go to the count because um, it was intended I'd just stay at the Trafford count and there was only the chance I'd be kind of carred into it. If, so I didn't even have a pass to get into the count. It was that unlikely. So it reminds me a bit actually of um, when I was preparing for this, uh, if you recall, everybody knows or remember Stephen Twig in 1997 when he beat Michael Portillo. Um, but that was a total surprise. And during that election, the 97 election in that Labour landslide, there were many candidates who won 
who hadn't even told their employer that they were standing as candidates and then had to go and have a quite difficult conversation the next day. So what happened to your life immediately after you got elected? Were you on the plane to Brussels the next morning? How did you deal with that impact on your on your work life as well? What happened in those in that first couple of weeks and days? Well, my employers are the NHS and I was working towards a particular job role and working um, on a temporary project up in Airedale um, in Yorkshire. Luckily, I did have a good relationship with my boss. Um, so she did enable me to go to the meeting um, next week um, that was in London where all the MEPs came together. But unfortunately, the NHS has long contracts um, termination for, you know, my notice period was 12 weeks. And many of the other MEP colleagues were a little bit more prepared than I were, had already left jobs or could leave with a few days notice. I knew that this could well be a very temporary role. And if I didn't work my 12 weeks notice, I was unlikely to ever get another job in the NHS again. So I had the unfortunate situation of having to work my um, 12 week notice. Um, my boss was kind to me and enabled me to shorten it to eight weeks. But still, you can imagine that still took me to the end of July. And I, I did I did lose out quite a lot because um, I was transitioning to another job at the time. So I lost the opportunity of another job I was transitioning to. And it had a big impact on my NHS career, which I can only really see now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it, nobody could understand why I couldn't just leave my NHS job. I can say I work in a clinical professional field. Had I just left my job, I would not have got a reference. I wouldn't be back doing my role that I am doing now so it was quite a big impact. Do you think that was positive though I mean this was something I mean for listeners Jane myself and another colleague at um, Edge Hill University Paula Keevney we've been running for things for a long time and Paula actually said to me well eventually one of us was going to get elected to something so this had obviously been your goal so do you have any do you have any regrets about that? Surely it was better to go on, uh, than not to go. Um, I, I don't have any regrets because I was reaching the point in my journey of wanting to impact, impact politically of thinking, well, I need to think now I might never make it. <laughs> um, and what do I do instead? I had got to that stage. Um, so I have no regrets. I have, I have experienced that impact of being a parliamentarian that I had wanted all my life so I have no regrets but I do think it took a huge toll on me um, kind of mentally and physically um, because of the fact I was still working my NHS role I was still elected councillor I was just elected as group leader of my Trafford group with two newbie other councillors who really felt completely neglected for a whole year whilst I was away in Brussels. Um, I had my ward casework still ongoing and it meant I had to make very quick decisions about what to do. I had to recruit staff very quickly. I had to make decisions about how to run my office. Um, and even two years later, I'm still, some of those decisions are still unraveling, but that's, that's another matter. I have absolutely no regrets and wouldn't change anything at all. I think having made it as a parliamentarian, if anything, it made me wish for that experience again. So working for the NHS whilst I'm very motivated and enjoy my role tremendously and make a huge difference to individuals, I hope. I don't feel I make that big impact that I really enjoyed about being a parliamentarian. I do miss that tremendously. Of course, I was incredibly pleased for you, but a little bit jealous at the same time um, because I've already realised that that is never going to happen for me but as you said you can make an impact when you're in that role and on that stage and I know that one of your core campaigning um, sort of agendas has always been about sustainability and about green issues so to what extent do you think that platform gave you to really drive some of those those core issues that you've been really passionate about to drive those forward? I think one of the things you realise when you become a parliamentarian is there is only a few windows of scope where you can make an impact and um, 
one of the things I realized quickly we'd make an impact on was making lots of videos on everything I did and I got somebody to take over my social media I literally handed over all my passwords and allowed somebody else to do that to free me up to be somebody who could be at the front of everything there were risks to doing that but I did think the only way I could make any impact at all is if I handed over all the mechanical detail stuff to my team that enabled me to be the person doing the speaking at the front um, and that's what I did so the committees I got placed onto in the parliament were the employment and social affairs committee which was an interesting one but I don't think that was in, as impactful as maybe some of the other committees might have been um, because the employment law is largely delegated to the nations and it, it was a very very interesting one to be on but not particularly impactful the one that I felt was most impactful was the committee that where I was um, the substitute but as a substitute you can make just as much imp impact and that was the environment public health and the food safety one which was much more up my street so I did feel as though I I did quite a lot there I think on the Brexit side of things we certainly played the media well and we um, did a lot in terms of just raising our profile as Lib Dems and creating that hopefully that legacy for when we can rejoin as um, as a nation. I Looking at recent events across on Eastern Europe with the Ukraine-Russian war and seeing how impactful the European Parliament is being now, it does make me long to still be there. And I look at those chambers, I can still remember where I used to sit and think, I wish I was there when Zelensky was making his speech to the European Parliament because I know how moving those kind of events can be and how passionate the MEP colleagues are in that European Parliament about those human rights issues, about champion liberty. And I just wish I could be there supporting those people who are standing up for freedom and liberty and all the values that I've long campaigned for. You talked about greening, I think, um, and sustainability. I did find I was probably at the edge of being green with my part, you know, my fellow MEPs. There was a, we certainly had different shades of green within that group. And I would place myself quite on the kind of dark green side of that with a, a couple of the other MEPs. So I think we often took a, a stronger line on the green and environmental objectives than some of our Renew Europe um, colleagues. But I think that was good because it was one of those times when everybody was becoming green and it was becoming an issue that was no longer kind of fringe or um with climate change really impacting i think it, it was an interesting time to be raising issues of climate change and biodiversity because i think we were starting to realize that this was an existential crisis and i did a, a quite a lot of work with um somebody I, I need to find her name to give her some publicity but there was a a lady who I met in London who is quite uh, prominent in this field and we did a lot of joint work together on the existential crisis um, of climate change and Brexit and that was a really interesting fruitful area of work I felt. I remember the name of the lady I worked with. She's called Professor Emmy Van Derzen. You may have heard of her, but I met her at a London meeting where she was looking at the impact of Brexit on UK citizens who um, were having issues because that they're European and their citizenship of the UK was being questioned. So she was a, a psychotherapist working that area, but she had a lot to say about the environment and I've invited her to a number of Green Liberal Democrat meetings that I think even you Joe have perhaps been part of a platform with her but that was a, a very fruitful collaboration that I had with her to um, carry on with the, the legacy that we built up as MEPs. So this uh, interview as I said at the beginning is for International Women's Day and I wondered you've got experience of being a councillor and as I said running for Manchester Mayor and running for Parliament. I wondered perhaps if you could contrast maybe the, the culture with regards women in politics in Europe and women in politics in the UK. I think instinctively, I would think that it was perhaps more women friendly 
in the European Parliament, but that might just be instinct. And actually, probably you might tell me that it's different. Well, one of the interesting things about being the one of 16 of the new MEPs from the UK was that um, we had a majority of women and that definitely changed the dynamics and the way we operated as a team. I don't think I've ever been part of such a, a well-bonded team. The men were equally involved and um, key to that, that as well. But it, it did give me a lot of hope for how having equal, and in our case, greater female representation certainly made me feel much more part of decision making. It made me feel that my style as a female was valid and that we, we could change things together. So being a, a bunch of powerful, um, influential women was just something I'll never forget really. I still, perhaps because of my NHS role and still and working the um, kind of two months notice I explained earlier, I still think I took longer to get up and running than maybe some of my colleagues did. But even so, I, I definitely feel that was probably the best political group of people I've ever, ever been part of. And we've all, we all um, are still making our impact in our own ways. But I think collectively we, we suffered a, a horrendous bereavement after um, the, the Brexit actually happened. And um, having a bereavement of that depth, I don't think that heals that quickly. It was perhaps a healing time that took a year and maybe we're still healing from from that that um that loss of um connection with with europe there has been and there continues to be conversations about how unfemale friendly or or to a, to an extent at least maybe not as much as it had been in the past westminster is um there have been debates about all kinds of issues to do with um maybe children in the chamber and things like this is the european parliament female friendly do you think in the way that it actually operates the mechanisms it, it's much more so i have never felt more equal in a work environment um i mean there were instances where there was still that unconscious bias i can give you an example i had a a young man who was my first member of staff who worked with me on the local elections the aldc intern who wanted to work in europe so um, he was interviewed for the job and was successful. I think he was only about 23, but he was quite a smart dresser. And we'd be walking through the corridors of um, the parliament initially, and most of the staff automatically assumed, even though he I was, was smartly MEP. dressed, that he was the MEP and I was the staffer. It happened so many times. The fact that I was, you know, a mature woman, smartly dressed, and I was with, uh, you know, a young man who was you know, equally smartly dressed, to be fair to him. It was just a, an unconscious bias that he was the um, the important one and I was the, the staff. <laughs> um, so, yes, I did. Exp but actually with the, um, the other MEPs, I haven't felt more equal because there was this strong group that I'm still part of called Renew. They called it Renew Ladies, but I think that's translation it's that's why it's called that and there's some amazing women on there um and that was a support group and that was quite a powerful group because the women communicated and connected in a way that was different to the way that I think possibly the old boys networked were much more supportive and building each other up I do find in more male groups there isn't that same level of your success is my success that you you get within that female group there was definitely a feeling of empowerment I'm, I'm in politics I'm not comfortable with um putting my colleagues down to build myself up I've never I never have been comfortable with that and I think sometimes that's how you're expected to be and that's a game I just won't play but I did feel with my female colleagues it wasn't necessary to be like that because actually when you're part of a team there's no I in team and you're all, all building up together that, that bit sounds really great but I'm yeah. still reeling from your revelation that people still assumed that the man was the MEP and you were yeah. <laughs> it happened <laughs> my my goodness and, and the same in the NHS people usually can assume the um you know the the smart man is the consultant and that that you know the woman isn't it, it it's it's unconscious bias is still out there everywhere in every walk of life 
Yeah, and I guess it's up to everybody to ch to challenge that because if you don't challenge it, then you are, for all intents and purposes, acquiescing to it. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Uh, some of the listeners will know I also ran for Parliament in, in 2010 and I found coming off of that and not winning um, a bit like a bereavement, like you said, but it was a very different political landscape and environment when I ran in 2010. And although my campaign was very high profile, social media was in its infancy back then and I didn't get that kind of social media sort of melee around me. But I've been really shocked to hear from female MPs and candidates the extent to which they receive abuse online, death threats, rape threats and all kinds of awful things. Did that happen to you when you were in the European Parliament or subsequently? If it happened to me whilst I was in the European Parliament, I was probably too busy doing the job to really notice it. But it certainly happened to me subsequently whilst I campaigned for my local election in May 2021. You might recall that that election was postponed from May 2020 due to COVID and we only had three weeks of campaigning. And I had a particularly nasty set of social media abuse from um, some local people who were Brexit supporters in my ward. They wanted to link the pact as an MEP with my local reputation because I happen to have a ward, simply ward, that is just over the line leave voters if you look at the data. So there, there was some point to doing that because if she could kind of link my local reputation with the fact I was an MEP there will be people who still felt that um you know we, we should we shouldn't have had that debate and the Liberal Democrats were wrong on the the leave remain debate so she definitely was tapping into that and it was just really really nasty so I, I have experienced that and I think the only way that I could personally handle that with in that three-week window was just to try and reach as many people as possible some of my colleagues tried to take on the um, social media abuse and, and it didn't come off well because social media is not particularly well regulated. So she could just block or ban people because she had the admins for this big social media group um, and had her fans who, who were some um, Brexiteer types who had a, had stood um, for on platforms that, that you know, weren't, weren't mainstream political platforms, certainly. Um, and that, that led to just them being able to abuse the position of social media. And there's not much, you know, Nick Clegg wasn't going to listen to me personally about a local thing. So the only way thing we could do was just to win the election campaign, which I did. But it was quite difficult and it took a lot of it. It was it took a lot out of me in terms of how personal this targeting was, because she managed to find out details about my family and my personal life and a lot of things got published which were just twisted versions of the truth the complete opposite of the truth actually but it was presented in a way which was believable which was was really quite hurtful um but anyway that that was my experience and and i i won the election and i did but i do think joe you're right that this nastiness against women has increased but i also think i'm just thinking of another thing here um but actually, we're looking at Ukraine now, aren't we? And we've got the most unlikely president of Ukraine, Zelensky. And he's the best kind of leader ever. He's not somebody who started out on that political journey to be a career politician. He was an actor in a comedy show and accidentally became president. And I can certainly relate to that. And I, I do think that people are looking for politicians who are more real, who are human, who aren't just career politicians who are tough and, and don't cry when it hurts and can't be reached by abuse. I, I think people want to feel that we, we experience the same life issues as everybody else. We just are tough enough to rise to that challenge. I hope that makes sense. No, I complete that. I think that's completely correct. And I, and I do like your attitude, which was the best way to beat her, was to win the election. But I do think as well that we do need more regulation in this area and people can't hide behind anonymity online um, and engage in hate speech and threaten people 
because you couldn't do that face to face. So I think we need to find a way to regulate social media so that these things are more on parity. I absolutely agree with that. And I think we're coming to appreciate that social media, the lack of regulation has led to misinformation getting out there. There's a lot of evidence now that some of the algorithms that have been used in various campaigns have meant that people just don't get balanced information from their social media platforms. And we're coming to appreciate now a lot more that um, these big <clears throat> Facebook, Twitter type organizations, they do need a lot more state regulation to stop, to make sure that the, the, the debate is heard and people aren't just targeted with, with information that is, is wrong and unbiased and tapping into their, their prejudices and amplifying um, those prejudices of people because we're all, we're all susceptible to that and I do think um, there's a lot more work to be done to make social media a more democratic and inclusive forum that protects minorities and enables debate to take place. Yeah and I think enable free speech rather than shut it down because Absolutely. it seems to be going in the opposite direction. Absolutely I think that's where the confusion comes in that um, there's a difference between free um, it, it's the way that just targeting messages that are wrong to particular groups where you don't have the alternative voice, you need that responsibility in media that organisations like the BBC have traditionally had and all, all our British news media. I know there's lots of debate about, you know, how, how much bias there is, and, and but it's about the fact you, you have to present different points of view and get people to make up their mind from a basis of accurate information as opposed to just inaccurate and targeted information and I think education is definitely something that we we all need in understanding how how these algorithms work so that we're not victim to those ourselves and also maybe this is something that goes back to education in schools that I mean I don't know about you but I learned as an adult how to discern information um, from a research point of view but I think often the how to discern sources of information is perhaps something we should teach our next generation a lot more and um, particularly in schools. I think you're probably right about that. Going back a little bit to the bereavement I, I completely identify with what you say about the intensity yeah. um, and that stops it stops it there's no ramp down just one day you're on it and the next day you're not and I found that very difficult and it was a bereavement for something that I always wanted to do when I couldn't do yeah. but what I would say is that once we got to the 2015 general election and those results came in although they were terrible for the Liberal Democrats it was after that point that I could look back on my time as a candidate with fondness and I even started to tell anecdotes about it so it does move to that place but it did take me five years to get to that place and sometimes because of some of the things that you alluded to there about the way in which some politicians project themselves on the national stage there is an assumption that people who put themselves forward for this are not human but actually we are all uh, human and um, are susceptible to the sort of the way in which politics can beat you around and what a brutal and cruel process it can be sometimes. You can still be, you can be the best candidate, have the best campaign and work the hardest, but that doesn't mean that you'll win. And sometimes some of those things are out of your control or in your case, you win and then you have it taken away from you over something that was out of your control. Yeah, and it's also quite hard to work out how to make the most of the experience once you've come out from there. And it took me a long time to work out what I need to be doing next and the only thing I really found that I could do next was going back to the NHS, but it, I had a big chunk of my career taken out. It took me three months to find a job and the NHS is unforgiving towards people who have a career break. Even though I'd done the uh, notice period, I still had to go back to a lower point in my career. And even now, uh, the way the, the kind of the NHS pay people, if you have a career break, you have to go right back to the bottom of the pay scale, even if you are back to the same level of job as you were before. It's an incremental scale that doesn't reward experience outside of the NHS. So that's quite hard when you think actually that career break I had was the best experience in my whole life. 
but I I still I I still am having to um, accept a, a kind of lowlier grade than I might have done um, had I not left, which I know that wouldn't be the same in some jobs, but that's just the way a big organisation like the NHS works. It it sticks to its rules and. Um, becoming um, a parliamentarian isn't something that's considered in any shape or form as a useful career move. Um, and if anything, I've experienced the opposite, that it's looked at um, rather, um, yeah, I, I tend just to keep, keep my roles very separate there for that reason. Yeah. I mean, that is a whole, that could be a whole other podcast. Um, because I have a whole host of questions about career breaks and that women are more likely to take career breaks than men and the impact on their careers. But we would be here for a long time yeah. if I started asking you those sorts of questions. I'd like to ask you one final question though, because the intensity, as you said, about trying to balance all of those things, uh, your notice period, being a local councillor and being an MEP and and family. All of the things, and family and all of the other thing and all of the things that you did in the parliament that perhaps you never thought you'd get to do or things that were that was that were I guess exciting how has that changed you as a person and, and your approach to your life now do you think that's changed you permanently um I don't think I've changed as a person I still experience as much um what's the psychological term for when you feel you're not quite up to it? Um, the imposter syndrome. Yeah, I, mean, I don't believe in that. <laughs> I still experience just as much imposter syndrome, both politically and in my career. But, you know, the only way to handle that is to kind of detach yourself from it and just do what you know is right and do what you know is you're good at. And I think I've always been somebody who's quite humble about my abilities and I'm not particularly somebody who would blow my own trumpet. So I think I, you just become comfortable with what you can do. But talking about the career break thing, I have had a long career break in my NHS work and politically. And I mean, I'm probably quite old now compared to many people, but I still feel I've got a lot of fight left in me to, to do good things in life. But I, the, the one legacy that it's a strange thing, but having that page on Wikipedia makes a difference. And my son said to me recently, mum, because um, he's quite into the fact his mum's got this Wikipedia page, he said, you know, like now you've been out of um, being an MEP for a while, you know, they might close down your Wikipedia page. <laughs> like, oh no, they can't do that. That's one of the few lasting legacies that you've got this Wikipedia page. And they said, oh, but they probably won't because you've still been a local councillor for 21 years and, and, and a parliamentary candidate. So, and because it links in with other things, like I was, you know, the last chair of the Young Liberals before the merger and things like that, I've got various links. He said, oh, because it links to other things, it probably won't. So I thought, okay, well, I know it's not much, but I'd, I'd quite like to keep my Wikipedia page. <laughs> yeah, but I think your legacy is, is bigger than a, 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 an internet entry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, th I think it's um, knowing what to do best now. And I'm at the stage in like, I mean, I play a lot of chess. I like playing chess. Um, I like the logicality of it. And you've only got certain moves you can do within the framework of life. And and often you do things like you, you blunder, you, um, you put your queen in the wrong place or whatever. And it's about just playing that game of chess to make the biggest difference. Um, so I do try to do that and I think I've also got to a stage in life where I'm largely supporting others rather than campaigning for myself. I feel my role now is to support the next generation. If there is a prominent role for me, I'm up for it, but I don't expect it. I'm more realistic and think now I'm supporting the next generation of, of women and campaigners and people who can, I love doing that at work, kind of supporting um, people and mentoring people who are at the beginning of their career to make the most of things and I know that when you're at that stage of trying to achieve something having somebody who mentors you and supports you can make a really massive difference um so I, I feel I'm at that stage of life that I will um if there were a role that I could um do that would bring it all together I would love that I have to say I haven't found it yet the closest I've got to having a useful role that brings it all together as being chair of the Northwest Lib Dems um, 
but it doesn't bring together my um, NHS or my um, public health role. I, I'd love to have a role that brought it all together, but that role has never happened. But if it ever did, I'd be up for it. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jane, for your time and for being so candid. And um, I think both of us would say that running for elected office is the best thing you can do. It's all consuming, but it's also sometimes the worst thing you could do. Um, but there's nothing, you don't get anything in life if there's if you're not sort of out there a little bit and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And um, I am just really glad that you out, you did manage to get there, um, even though I am a little bit envious. But thank you so much for um, joining us today on this podcast. And for those of you who are listening, if you are interested in the rest of our International Women's Day activity for this year, please go and look at our website, which you can find by going to edgehill.ac.uk. Thanks very much, everybody.